Well, let me ask you this. We move into uh, the election cycle. Uh, we have all the way to November, assuming that you take the primary. Uh, you are likely going to be running against, I believe, uh, U.S. Senator Kay Hutchinson. I don't know if Larry Kilgore has announced his candidacy. I haven't uh, gotten that far into the research on it. What is the incumbent's position on parental rights from your perspective at this point? I think there are two things that, you know, the governor talks a great parental rights uh, line. Uh, he's also been a friend of homeschoolers. There's no question he's been a friend of homeschoolers. Um, and yet he um, advocated or, um, in fact, issued an executive order to vaccinate every 11-year-old girl in the state of Texas with Gardasil vaccine. Um, that's a decision that ought to be left up to parents. It ought not be mandated by your government that your child be injected with anything, uh, much less a vaccine that hasn't been proven. But I, I'm a registered nurse by profession. If I had, if I had a miracle cure, I could use the governor's office as a bully pulpit to tell everybody how wonderful this cure is. But it is never within the realm of government to mandate that its citizens take anything. Um, and so that's one just recent action that I think made people all over the state just sit up and say, "Oh my goodness, what are you thinking?" And is there, there was lots of speculation, of course, about how much money was flowing from the pharmaceutical lobby into the governor's coffers. I don't know what the real reasons were for that, but irregardless of what the reasons are, the job of the governor is to stand up for the citizens of his state and mandating that 11-year-old girls all over the state be injected with a vaccine is just completely inappropriate. You made mention of um, the taking of the children in El Dorado. That was unconscionable. We had a Republican governor, a Republican lieutenant governor, a Republican Speaker of the House, a Republican Attorney General, a Republican Supreme Court, and Republicans on appellate courts all over the state, and we took out of the community. I, I cannot fathom how we allowed that to happen. You know, and it's my understanding that the Department of Human Services in Texas, which is part of the executive branch, was behind that taking. I mean, it's Child Protective Services is typically controlled through the executive branch, and at any point in time, the governor probably could have stopped that. Is that an accurate statement? I, I would certainly hope so. It's one of the things that um, I'm looking into. I didn't bring my economic, I don't have my economic policy book right here at my hand, but one of the questions I'm asking is why has um, Child Protective Services in the state of Texas grown at the rate that it has? We have tremendous county sheriffs and local police departments, and it seems to me that law enforcement um, belongs to county sheriffs and local police departments. It doesn't belong to the state house. So I wonder why we've seen such a shift of child protective services to a state level so that we have this kind of statewide um, police force going around. I've been shocked, and I mentioned that over the last uh, several months I've had some things come to my attention. I've done more traveling around the state in the last two years than I've probably done in most of my life prior to that time, and I've uh, had occasion to meet two families. Uh, unfortunately, both of them had lost children. Um, the suspicion was that those infants or those young children died uh, of a SIDS-related, sudden infant death-related syndrome, before either child was buried, before their funeral had occurred, CPS was knocking on the door of that home to investigate the home uh, for any possible abuse, and in one instance, took the other children out of the home. That grieves me to my core. I'm a nurse. I've been in the emergency room uh, when parents have lost children, and that is you know, a trauma that, that, that all of us hope we never have to go through and seeing it up close and personal know how difficult it is. As a parent, I cannot imagine going through that. The grief of being in that condition and having my government knocking on my door threatening to remove the other children from my home is another heinous atrocity in my mind.
Well, you know, with uh, uh, regards to these uh, mass takings, uh, you know, you had just wit you expressed how you have witnessed that the the police force of the state has increased dramatically. Uh, you know, and part of this is through federal mandates that actually are results oriented, and I tend to say that they're negative results oriented because what's happening is that for every child that is taken from a uh, a household, federal funding starts when the child is placed with a licensed foster care agency or uh, with a relative guardian now due to some changes last year in, the, in what's referred to as the Title IV E program from the federal government. It's part of the Social Security Act. But it's results oriented, which means that the funding doesn't start until the child is removed and then placed. So if the child is removed but yet still not placed, there's no federal funding that flows into the state. But the minute that child is placed into a foster care and an emergency taking, then there's a flow of money that begins into the state coffers. So I think that what you're witnessing is that for every increase in the number of employees that are taking children from households, there's a commensurate amount of funding that's received. And, and the disturbing part about this is that there's not, there's not nearly as many incentives for replacement, placing the children back in the control of their own parents, as there is for adopting children out, which means that the result comes from getting the children placed into other homes. So how is that going to encourage state agencies to do the right thing and fix the problems with the family so that the family can have their children back? So I think that that's one of the things that you're witnessing, and these programs permeate every aspect of family court-related issues, whether it's child support enforcement through uh, Attorney General Greg Abbott's office, uh, you know, it's all paid for results. For every order created, uh, there is going to be a commensurate amount of federal funding. Now, to me, there's a statement to be said with the Tenth Amendment, and I want to hear your view on what do you think about these these federal incentives that demand that the state follow every single mandate in order to receive funding. Are you against these types of mandates that guide state policy, or are you for this federal funding that guides state policy? Absolutely opposed. Again, there's an area where the governor has recently come out and, you know, talked a strong line, but he's got nearly 10 years in the office where he's not stood to defend Texans or Texas families about that overreaching arm of the government. The whole time you were talking about the compensation that comes to the state when they place these children, um, I'm thinking, you know, the root of evil is the love of money. You know, we... We have got to recognize the things that destroy individual liberty and families and communities and begin to stand against those. And the governor of each state and every state has a, a duty and an obligation to keep that federal government in check, to help keep that federal government in check. That was the purpose of the Tenth Amendment, to say you only have those very limited powers enumerated to you in the Constitution. Everything else resides with the state and with the people therein. We have got to push that federal government back into its proper realm. We're looking here in Texas at the types of things that the governor can do. Certainly, the money coming from the federal government is a pretty big stick for them to hold or a pretty big carrot for them to hold in front of states. But we've got great examples of states uh, just in recent years who have, and, and it, we ought not be um, some in Texas are waving around the word secession. There's really a provision available to states, uh, and it's called nullification. And there are states in our union who have nullified federal law in recent years. Montana's legislature, for example, nullified Real ID. There are states that are pushing back on the No Child Left Behind legislation because they don't believe, one, it's constitutional, or two, it's in the interest of the children of their state or the education of the children in their state to comply with those No Child Left Behind requirements. So there are lots of opportunities for states, either through the governor's office and or through the state legislature, to nullify those actions by the federal government. When we begin to push back on those, I hope we can get some cooperation out of Washington to quit uh, bribing us to do things that are detrimental to the citizens of our state. 